Welcome back to Engineering Circuit Analysis. In this lesson, we're going to get an overview of transformers and mutual inductances in circuits. Now, in the last section, we reviewed the concept of inductance. We talked about the concept of mutual inductance, and then we drew a few circuits to kind of illustrate how, how, we, can have and how we can have those kinds of circuits in real life, and we're going to talk in more detail about how to solve them as the course proceeds. In this lesson, what I want to do is dive into the concept of a transformer because I know that everybody watching this has heard of what a transformer is, and many of you probably already know more or less how transformers work. What I want to do is I want to give you an overview. So just keep in mind, everything we talk about in this lesson, we're going to be discussing in great, great, great detail, much more detail than I will cover here as the course proceeds because there is more to it than what I'm going to talk about here. But still, at the beginning of this course, it's really instructive to get a roadmap of where we're going so that as we uh, cut through all of that math that we're going to get to, you'll understand what the end game is and why we're doing it. So let's talk about the concept of a real transformer. So I'm going to call it real transformer. In a second, you'll understand why. Transformer. All right. I call it a real transformer because in real life, all circuit components, are, they're not perfect. Right? So all circuit components have resistance and inductance and capacitance. And we, so what we do is we generally have to deal in the real world with real items. But when we talk about circuits, we have idealized components. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go a little backwards. I'm going to show you what a real transformer really looks like. And then I'm going to draw an ideal transformer so you can see how it's much more simplified. And then we're going to talk about how an ideal transformer will operate in a real circuit briefly. And then you'll understand why in real life you don't ever get that performance because in real life we don't have ideal transformers. So we're going to start out with the real deal, um, at, least, at least to the level that we can get to in this problem. So what we have is on the left-hand side, we'll have some voltage source, we'll call it V. It's a sinusoidal source, of course. Um, and then we have some source impedance. We're just going to put it in a box and we're going to call it ZS. So this is some inductance, capacitance, resistance associated with the source. All right. And then over here, I'm going to put a dot here. You'll understand why I do that in a second. And then we'll have a resistance. And then we'll have a coil of wire. And then we'll tie it, we'll have another dot here, and then we'll tie it back around like this. And then physically close to it, but not touching it, we will have another coil of wire. Don't pay too much attention to how I'm drawing my curls. I'm doing that because it's a schematic. In the real world, it really does matter if you wind it this way or if you go the other direction, so this way, so it would be this way, right? The direction of the turning on the coils does matter in how the voltages and the polarities will work, but for the purpose of the drawing here, you don't have to worry about that stuff. It's just a schematic, and we're going to get to those details later. Then there'll be some resistance here. Another dot I'll explain in a second, and then over here we have some load resistance, so I'll call that ZL. And then here we will have another dot, and so here we go. So this is your basic transformer circuit, so let's, lo let's uh, label a couple of things. We're going to have first, let me grab my red pen here. First of all, we're going to have, I'm going to call this point A. It's just going to make it easier to reference. Point A, point B, point C, and point D in the circuit. And then what we have here, this resistance, we're just going to call it R sub 1. We're going to call this resistance R sub 2. It could be whatever. Usually they're very, very small. And then what we have here, these resistances are basically modeling the resistance of the coil of wire itself. Of course, you know the coil has inductance, but it's made of physical matter, so it also has an actual resistance, a couple milliohms or microohms or something if it's just a, a copper wire. So this R1 is the resistance of the coil. We just have to split it out because we have to draw them separate. So this resistor is not a separate component. It's actually the resistance of the wire. Same thing with this guy. Now the inductance of this coil, this coil here is going to have, let's kind of, kind of draw a little note here. It's going to have N1 turns. And this coil over here is going to have N2 turns. And N1 and N2 can be whatever you want. You're, you're the circuit designer. You can just do it however many turns you need for your design. But for this example, let's just put some numbers in here. Let's say this is 4 millihenries, and let's say this is 3 millihenries. Okay? So when you write the inductance next to the coil, that's the self-inductance, L. So L1 is 4 millihenries, and L2 is 3 millihenries. So far, so good. But we've brought these things in such close proximity that whenever the current actually goes through the circuit and generates a magnetic field, and it's, an, it's a sinusoid, so it's getting bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, we brought this coil close enough so the magnetic field 
of this wire, of this coil, is cutting through, bigger and smaller, the secondary one here. All right? And the closer we get them, the more that interaction actually happens. So in order to denote that, like we showed you in the last section, we draw a double-headed arrow pointing to, from this coil to this one. And we'll just put a number here just for the point of illustration. We'll call it 1 millihenry. So this is the basic idea behind a ideal transformer. Now, I mean, I'm sorry, a real transformer. Now, the reason I put A and B and so on is so I can draw this dotted line here. And I'm going to get in the way of my words. I don't like that. But I'll go ahead and do it like this, like this. OK, the reason I put the purple dotted line there is because everything inside of this dotted line is what we call the transformer. When you buy a transformer from you know, some circuit supply warehouse or if you make it yourself, you're going to get a bunch of coils and stuff and it's going to be generally wrapped and a lot of times it'll be uh, even coated in plastic to protect the, the windings and all that stuff. So you can't even really see them too well. Sometimes you can though. And on one side of this thing, there'll be two leads coming out. We call that A and B. And on the other side of the transformer, we'll have two more leads, and we call that C and D. So I'm just going to kind of label it like this for now. We're not going to use this A, B, C, D too much, but I wanted just to tell you that everything inside of the dotted line is what we call the, quote, the transformer. The primary winding is what we call the left-hand winding. The secondary winding is what we call the right-hand winding. The primary winding has an inductance of four, millihenries and a resistance component of very, very small, usually a few milliohms or less. And the secondary winding has an inductance, self-inductance of three millihenry, again with a very small resistance component associated with it. And then there's a mutual inductance uh, between the coils of one millihenry. This mutual inductance just means that when this coil is activated, it's inducing a voltage over here. Right? If I flip it around and put the source on the other side, so I'm driving this one, it means that the, the current swinging up, up and down through here would induce a voltage in the other coil. But since I have the source over here, this is the driving side of the circuit, so the secondary coil has, would have an induced voltage that would be uh, given by the equation we talked about in the last section, M di1 dt. So mutual inductance times how fast the, or the derivative of the current in the other side of the circuit. Okay, so I have some notes here. I just want to make sure I've gone through all of them. I'm not going to write them. It'll take too long. So um, basically, this is what we call a real transformer. It has losses in the source. This is the source part driving. That's Z sub S. It has losses in the load. That's the load, whatever it is, inductors or capacitors over here. It has losses in coil one. What I mean by losses is there's a resistance here, so you have dissipative heat. And it has losses in the secondary coil. as a finite self-inductance here, in this case it's four, a finite self-inductance in coil number two, L1 and two, and a finite mutual inductance, in this case we call it one. Um, now, what we're going to do in a second is I'm going to draw this circuit again, but I'm going to draw it in an idealized way, because that's usually how you start these kinds of discussions, talk about the ideal transformer. It's a lot easier to, re to uh, understand and to do the analysis of it. But I just want to let you know that after we get through all that math, and we get through all the entire course, the reason we're doing you know, so much here is like a lot of introductory textbooks, basic textbooks, they'll talk, or even hobbyist type things. We'll talk about transformers and they'll give you some equations for transformers. But those equations usually given in the more basic books are very idealized, perfect equations that we can't really use in real life for engineering because we don't have perfect transformers. You can see that this guy has resistances everywhere, mutual inductances and all kinds of things. So for instance, if I was going to stand at the source here, and look, for lack of a better word, look through terminals A and B and look this direction, what would be the impedance looking back toward the load? I mean, typically if you're at the source and you look at the, your load, then your load impedance is what you see. But in this case, I'm looking through a transformer, so I've got this mutual inductance business, which means it's very hard to understand what impedance I would see. The load impedance is over there, but it's not even physically connected to the coil. So how does that play into it? And then there's also these, these uh, impedances due to, or these resistances due to the coil windings themselves. So how does that play into it? One of the things we're going to spend a lot of time much later on talking about real transformers is we're going to calculate what the impedance would look like if you, had, if you put a, basically a resistance meter between here and look that direction. Because the load impedance does factor into it, 
all of these things factor, all of these terms factor into it, and it's kind of a complicated equation to derive it, but once you have the answer, you can calculate what that impedance looks like looking from the source. You might need to know that because a lot of times you match your source impedance to be similar to your load impedance for power transfer reasons and other things, or maybe you're designing a waveguide or some other something else, and you have to know what that impedance looks like in order for your system to work right. So you have to know how to calculate that stuff. So I just want to let you know that in the real world, it's, the math is more complicated, but what we're going to do now is transition from talking about the real transformer to an ideal transformer, and we can have some fun playing around with what, what, how we could use that, so, or at least in an ideal way. So we have the concept of an ideal transformer. Okay, how does an ideal transformer differ from this guy? I am going to write these down. First of all, L1, the first coil, and L2 equal infinity Henry's. That's the first thing, uh, equal infinity Henry's. Now, in real life, you can't get infinite uh, inductances, but in an ideal transformer, you can, uh, at least ideally, right? Second thing is, the mutual inductance between the two coils is infinity Henry's. Obviously, we can't have that either. The third thing is we have no coil losses. So the main difference between an ideal transformer and this real one is that in an ideal transformer, this is zero. There is no loss due to coil one, resistance loss. This is zero because there's no loss here. This inductance is not four millihenries, it's infinity henries. This is infinity henries, and then this is infinity henries also. And you might say, how can that even be possible? Well, it can't be possible. It's not possible. But I haven't even talked about this yet. We'll talk about it a lot more later. When we wind these inductors or these transformers, in order to make the inductances really, really high to approach the ideal inductor case, and to make the mutual inductance closer to infinity, as close as we can get, we don't wind these coils on air, right? What we do is we wind them on iron or nickel or something like that that's a magnetic material. I'm gonna talk about this a lot more later, but what that does is when you wind your inductor on top of a material that's magnetic like iron or that's able to be magnetized like iron, then what happens is the magnetic field of the coil here interacts with the iron and it lines up all of the atoms inside of the iron so that they're kind of oriented, they start, they snap into place so that they're oriented in a, in a common direction, which then allows that iron to generate a magnetic field that adds up with the magnetic field that you're kind of supplying the circuit with. And the end result of it is if you wind a coil on iron, you get a much, much lar larger inductance because the magnetic field you can generate by winding on iron is much, much bigger than you could generate by winding on air. Like if I just wound an inductor on this thing and then removed it so that I had a coil of wire with air inside, I could generate some magnetic field there by hooking a current source up to it. Of course I could. But if I wound this thing on iron or some other magnetic material, then for the same current I'm supplying into the coil, I would generate a much larger magnetic field. And that's because the coil is generating a magnetic field, but it's also aligning the iron atoms so that they start spinning in the common direction to the coil and it generates a magnetic field from the iron that's an induced magnetization that then adds up with the original one so it's much, much bigger overall. So the bottom line of all of that is, yes, it looks ridiculous to have infinity uh, uh, inductances and infinity mutual inductance, but you can get very high inductances by just winding everything on iron. And, or whatever other magnetic material you have, and that's why almost every transformer is wound on some material. When you actually look at it, it's not wound on air, it's wound on something like either iron or cobalt or nickel or something like that, and that's the reason why. Get higher magnetic fields, higher inductances, higher mutual inductance, because you wind it on the same physical structure, or put them very close together to get that high. So, this is what an ideal transformer looks like, that's how we accomplish the goal, how do we continue on uh, from there? So what we have for this ideal transformer, now that we kind of know what we're talking about here, is we have the voltage source driving on the primary side, and we have some source impedance, which we always have for a source, right? And then we have this terminal A that we talked about in the past, and we have a coil of wire, but notice there's no resistance, there's no resistor in that model because we've said that it's equal to zero. And then on the secondary side, we again have some coil that's physically close to the first one. Again, no resistance here, and then there is some load resistance over here, right? 
and then we'll call this terminal C and this terminal D. So the ideal transformer, comparing it with the first case, I guess I'll use purple again since uh, that's what I did in the first uh, time, is I will say, well, it basically includes everything here. So that the only thing sticking out are these terminals, A, B, C, and D. Notice now that the only thing inside of here is uh, the coils. There are the coils. There's no, there's no resistor here. There's no losses due to that stuff. And then, just to be absolutely clear, you don't typically have to write this down because we, know, we all know what an ideal transformer is. But what we'll do is we'll just say that right here, this primary inductance is infinity Henry's. And then we will then say that the secondary inductor is infinity Henry's. And then we will then say that the mutual inductance between the two, uh, M, is also equal to infinity Henry's. Now again, we don't have to write all that stuff, but we typically do. And then we will say we have N1 turns of the primary inductor and N2 turns of the secondary inductor. So literally, we can't build this in real life. But what it is compared to the original guys is exactly the same drawing except we've taken these out. We've made this infinity, this infinity, and this infinity. Everything else is the same. N1, N2 turns, everything else is the same. Uh, here we go. Now to physically build this, we can't do it. But what we can do is we can build two tightly coupled coils that are literally bound, uh, wound either very close to each other or literally on top of one another, sharing a common core which is, has a very high or yields very high inductances, um, which would be like an iron core or a cobalt core or something like that, something magnetic, something that can be magnetized by the, the, the magnetic field that is generated by the current flowing through those coils. Now this is the kind of thing you'll typically see, I mean you don't see all the infinities everywhere, but this is the kind of thing, the ideal transformer is typically what you see in a basic electronic, electronics textbook or a hobbyist textbook or something because it's a great idealized thing. You have a coil, a coil, N1 turns, meaning like maybe 50 turns, N2 turns, can be you know 120 turns, whatever. Uh, but what is the point of this thing? Why do I want to build transformers? What is it useful for? Well, the first thing that you obviously see that makes transformers useful is that you're physically separating the left-hand side of the circuit from the right-hand side of the circuit. So there are a lot of applications in circuits and engineering in general where you really want to isolate the left-hand side from the right-hand side. Now, they're not totally isolated because you have current here which generates a magnetic field. The magnetic field cuts into the second one which can generate a voltage here. So you can influence, you are influencing the second half of the circuit by things that are happening in the first, right? But still, a physical break here is often very, very good for lots of things like surge protection, um, lightning strikes, uh, there, there are many other noise type applications where you have a noise going on and you want to eliminate the noise on the second hand side. I mean, you still have to develop your circuit and stuff to make it work right. You can't just put a transformer in there and say it's done. But there are cases when you want to physically isolate the left hand and the right hand side and the transformer does do that. Although you obviously have an influence on the secondary side based on what's happening on the first hand side. There's a physical break there. The main reason though that you build a transformer is because it has a property that we're about to talk about now that basically allows you to take whatever voltage you see on the input side of this transformer and either step up that voltage or step down that voltage on the output side of the secondary part of that transformer. So in other words, I could drive this transformer with some known voltage source and then I can use the transformer to make that voltage actually larger on the output, right? Um, maybe I start with 50 volts on the primary side and I can make the output 100 volts, right? Pretty neat, right? Um, alternatively, which is actually is more commonly instead of stepping things up, well stepping things up happens a lot with power generation, but typically in your house you're always stepping things down. You know, like you have uh, 120 volts coming out of your wall, but you don't want 120 volts to plug into your iPhone or to your tablet or whatever, so for the charger that's in there, you only want 5 volts or whatever it is, 7 volts, 5 volts, whatever it is. So in many cases, you'll have a transformer. That's a lot of times what's inside of the power brick that you're plugging into the wall. is two coils of wire that's taking the primary, which is uh, the wall, and it's actually lowering the voltage to, to whatever device you're trying to plug it into. Because the voltage you have, 
coming into that secondary device needs to be smaller a lot of times. If it's a computer device with delicate electronic circuitry, it could be damaged with higher voltage. So you, you want those devices to operate at a lower voltage, so you step it down. So the transformer can step the voltage up, step the voltage down. Now you might ask yourself, that's pretty neat. You can step up or step down the voltage. It sounds like I'm getting free energy, right? It sounds like I'm just getting free stuff because I can make the voltage higher. Well, it turns out that there's no free lunch in the universe. You cannot get free energy out of the system. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. But basically, yes, you can step up the voltage up and down. The punchline is, if you step the voltage up on the output, on the output side, then by definition, the current flow on the output is stepped down from what's on the other side, and vice versa. So if I try to design this thing to increase the voltage on the outside, on the output, Sounds like I'm getting something for free. Well, you're really not because when you do that, the current that's flowing on the front side is going to be then stepped down to a lower value on the, on the output. So if you increase the voltage by a step-up transformer, then the current has been decreased on the output compared to the input. If I go the opposite way, if I step down the voltage, then the current is stepped up on the output side. So uh, that basically means that you're not getting something for nothing because the current is being adjusted directly in lock, lockstep with the voltage. And it's all because of the physics involved. Now what we're going to do later on in the class is we're going to derive a lot of relations. But I'm going to give you the punchline right here because you can learn a lot just from the punchline and then just know that as we go on in the class we're going to derive these relations. You'll, you'll already have an idea about why they're useful and why we care about them. So let's go and take a look. They're very simple. Okay, so for an ideal transformer, the following relations are true. You have a voltage relation, a voltage relation, which is V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. And that's so important that I'm actually going to circle it. Now you might see this equation written different ways in different books, but the, the way that you know, I'm writing it is V1 over N1. That means the voltage across this coil divided by the number of turns of coil 1 is the same exact ratio as the voltage across coil 2. I haven't drawn the voltages, but it's the voltage across vo coil 2 divided by the number of turns in coil 2. Now this is a, a, a nice way to remember the relation because it's symmetrical, um, but really a, a more instructive way to remember it is like this. If I just solve for V1 here, I'm sorry, solve for V2, V2 by moving in over here is going to be N2 over N1, just multiply by N2. Uh, times V1. So what this equation means, remember I told you you could step up the output or step down the output, right? That's what I told you. So what this means is the output voltage, V2, is whatever V1 is, but multiplied by something. So if I choose N1 and N2 properly, I can make the output voltage bigger because I'll be taking the input voltage and mul multiplying by something. Now let's um, well, we'll get into an example in a second, but if you choose the coil, the number of coils on the, on the right hand side bigger than the number of coils on the primary, this number will be bigger than 1 multiplied by the input voltage means your output voltage will be larger than the input voltage. And if you do it in a reverse way where this is smaller than this, then this will be a decimal and you'll cut the voltage down. So that's why I'm saying you can step up the voltage, you can step down the voltage. And for an ideal transformer, ideal transformer, that relationship that tells you if you're going to step the voltage up or down is just called the turns ratio. It's basically the output turns on the output side divided by the input uh, turns. All right, now let me write one more equation because I gave you the punchline already. I told you the current also varies. So for the current, it varies as follows. I sub 1 times N sub 1 is equal to I sub 2 N sub 2. Now I haven't labeled I, but you know what N1 and N2 are. I1 is the current circulating through this inductor. The current going through inductor 1, that's I1. The current going through this inductor here is called I2. So you see this is a nice symmetric way to remember this equation because this is basically V1 over N1, V2 over N2. I1 times N1, I2 times N2. So they're symmetric. They look different. One's a fraction and one's not. But it's all the ones on one side, all the twos on the other side for both equations. Now again, this is the way it's easy to remember, but I think a more instructive way is to write it as follows. Let me solve for the output current. So I2 is equal to, we're going to divide by N2. So on the left you're going to have I1 over, uh, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing already. It's going to be um, N1 over N2 uh, times I sub 1. So forget about the voltage, just look at the current. What this is telling you is that the current on the output side of the transformer, 
is going to be equal to the current on the input side of the transformer multiplied to time some, some ratio. So you see, depending on if you choose N1 and N2 correctly, whether it's bigger or smaller than 1, when I multiply it, I can get a bigger or smaller output current than what I have on the input side. But here's the crazy thing about it. Let's go back to our first example. Let's say I want to make the voltage bigger. The voltage, let's say I want to get bigger. So if I want to make this voltage bigger, I need to have N2 bigger than N1. In other words, I have to have more turns on the right-hand side of the output than turns on the, on the input side. So that's going to make a number bigger than 1, so I'm going to have a bigger output voltage. But if I choose N2 bigger up here to do that, then N2 is bigger down here. That means that if I choose it to be a larger ratio here, because it's flipped upside down, then every time I make this a bigger number than 1, this one's going to be smaller than 1. Which means that every time I make the current, the voltage larger, using that um, turns ratio equation, then because I'm inverting it in the equation down here, it makes the current smaller than the input current. So if I step up the output voltage, that's great. Sounds like you get something for free. But then you realize, well, wait a minute, the current went down as a result of that. It's all because of the math here. If I make the voltage go down on the output side, then because the ratio is flipped over, I'm going to make the output current actually bigger. Okay? So let's do a quick, quick, quick example. Um, this is not really an engineering level example. It's not a hard example. But it's illustrative to show you what I'm talking about. So let's say I want to make the output voltage bigger. I want to make the output voltage bigger. I want to get free energy, let's say. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to get free energy, but I would like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I'm going to make this ratio bigger than 1. So I'm going to make N2, I'm going to make it equal to 50 uh, turns. That means this coil here, N2, is 50 turns around its core. N1 has to be less than that, so I'm going to call it 10 turns. I could make up any numbers I want to illustrate the point, but I'm choosing simple numbers. So because N2 is bigger than N1, I know this fraction is going to be large, so I'm going to multiply times this, and V2 should be bigger. Let's calculate what V2 actually is. And by the way, we can take this and we can say that N2 over N1 is 50 over 10, just basically plugging the numbers in. So I have a turns ratio of 5. That means that this ratio here is 5. So whatever the input voltage I stick in there, the output's going to be 5 times that. Right? That's pretty cool. It's like almost like free energy you think you're getting. But again, I'm telling you ahead of time you're not going to get any real free energy out of it because what's going to happen is the following. Let's calculate the output voltage, V2. It's just as we said a second ago, N2 over N1 times V1. N2, we already know, is 50 divided by 10 times, what is the input voltage? Well, I haven't given you any input voltage yet because I forgot to, to do that. So let's pick some input voltage. Let's say, we'll just pick anything, literally. V1, let's say it's equal to 10 volts. And let's say I1, the current on the primary side of the transformer, is 2 amps. What we're saying here is we've defined an ideal uh, transformer. We've said this turn over here is 10, this turn over here is 50, so the output turn is larger. And we've said on the input side, this voltage here across the inductor is 10 volts, the current going through that inductor is 2 amps. So these are the input, on the input side of the transformer, we've just listed it, and now we have a known turns ratio. So now that we have that, we have a turns ratio times, this is just given in the problem statement, times 10. So what we're going to have is 5 times 10. So what you're going to get for V2 is 50 volts. 50 volts. So it looks like you're getting free energy, right? Because you started with 10 volts on the primary side, but then the output is 50 volts. So that's why I said you can step it up, you could step it down. But let's take a look a little more closely at what's happening to the current in this situation, right? We're given the initial conditions here. What happens to the current? I2 is equal to what? We said right here, it's the turns ratio but flipped upside down times the input current. So it's N1 over N2 times the input current. But N1 is the primary turn is 10 and the other turn is 50. So it's literally this ratio flipped upside down times the input current I'm giving to you is 2 amps. So what do I have? Well I have 1 fifth times 2 which is 2 fifths, right? And so when I do two-fifths, what do I get? I2 0.4 amps. Okay, 0.4 amps. So what happened here, you see, 
is that I chose a turns ratio to give me a bigger voltage. I calculate the output voltage and it does indeed turn out to be larger than the input voltage. But with that same turns ratio, when I plug the turns in because it's flipped upside down for the current equation, here I started with a current of 2 amps but I didn't get a higher current, I got a lower current, a much lower current, 0.4 amps. Right, 0.4 amps. So these were the initial guys, these were the final guys. I want to do one more thing to really show you why you're not getting a free lunch. Let's look at the power. On the input side, we're going to calculate the power, and on the output side, we're going to calculate the power, right? On the input side, current times voltage is 2 and 10. So we have P1 on the input, I1 times V1, that's the current and the voltage going across that transformer. It's uh, basically, what did I say it was? 2 amps and 10 volts, right? 2 amps, 10 volts. So the primary power is 20 watts. On the output side, after we stepped it all up and down with the transformer, we got 0.4 amps and we got 50. What do you think is going to happen? So it's going to be P2 is I2V2. Uh, the current was 0.4, 50, I think was the voltage, right? And so P2, when you stick that in your calculator, you're going to get 20 watts. These are equal, so you have no free lunch. Okay, so what is literally going on here is we have indeed stepped up the voltage on the right-hand side. But the laws of physics tell us that this coil, even though the voltage is higher, is physically incapable of supplying more current than 0.4 amps because of the law of conservation of energy in science, in math, and physics, right? So a lot of times people think, well, I'm going to step this transformer up to 20,000 volts. That's like a huge voltage. I'm getting something free. But reality, no, because it can't supply very much current. It can't push very many electrons. And that's because the source of the energy, for lack of a better word, on the right-hand side trying to push those electrons is ultimately coming from the left-hand side. It's just going through an intermediary which is called the magnetic field. Everything is coming from the source. It's going into the current here, which goes into this thing called a magnetic field, which induces a voltage through mutual inductance in the secondary coil, which generates an output voltage, which pushes electrons in the secondary circuit. But ultimately, from a load point of view, the current and the voltage here yields a certain power which is joules per second, right? That's what power is. And that power here, supplied here, has to be exactly the same as the power going in. You can't have a free lunch. The power going into this box has got to be the same as the power going out of that box. If you can build a box that puts more power out than what you're getting on the inside, then you just won the Nobel Prize and you're the richest person on, on, on the planet. Because you, you, you obviously could sell that, but you can't do that. So that is an introduction to transformers. Um, and mutual inductance as well. I wanted to give you these relations, not so that you can be an expert in ideal transformers, not so that you can be an expert right now at real transformers with all of these resistances, but just so you have an idea of the roadmap of where we're trying to go. Right? Because what we're going to do in the remainder of the course is we're going to dive more into the physics. We're going to talk about that concept of inductance more, and we're going to talk about the physics associated of where it comes from. And then we're going to talk about mutual inductance and the physics associated of where that comes from. And then we're going to write a bunch of circuits down and dealing with mutual inductance so that we can get some comfor comfortable writing some equations down uh, for, for, for circuits that you could build. And then we're going to talk about transformers. We're going to derive lots of relations for the ideal transformer, in which case these equations are going to apply. But then we're going to also spend some time talking about real transformers. Because we're going to, in many cases, we're going to be very interested in calculating the impedance looking this direction through from the source looking towards the load, and that requires a lot more math. So rather than bogging you down with all that math up front, I wanted you to know where we're going. So we have a summary here of the next however many hours it's going to take to get through that. So continue on with me to the next section, and we'll roll up our sleeves and we'll get serious about it. Uh, but now you have a roadmap, so you can keep this in the back of your mind as we conquer those topics in engineering.